here we are. All right. This Hangout is live on air. And uh, just in time, hold on, I'm going to just let us know, let everybody know that we are, in fact, live. Um, Rangula, welcome to uh, Security Ledger Live. It's great having you. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. This is our um, second episode, and so, um, you know, excuse any um, technical difficulties or hiccups, but... Um, <laughs> is that one already? I, I can excuse you for that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So, um, so Ron, tell me just a little bit about um, just a little bit about your background for for folks who might be in the audience and um, not be familiar with you. Um, former NSA employee, and you went out and 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 started this company, Tenable Networks, with a tool that I think a lot of people in the security community probably know or have used, which is the Nessus Vulnerability Scanner. So mm -hmm. just give us a little bit of the um, origin myth of Ron Gula and kind of how you went from being a government uh, information security pro to an entrepreneur. Excellent. Um, yeah, so real briefly, got my start in the Air Force at the National Security Agency doing penetration testing of the good guys. So basically, we would be brought in to do vulnerability assessments, security assessments, or to the great team. This was mid-90s, so this was well before like a lot of the industry. It's before PCI, you know, was, was invented, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, got to, after that, I got to work in the local area at uh, a couple companies, BBN, folks who invented the internet, right? I met the guy who made the at sign. Right, but I met a lot of people a lot smarter than, than, than I was about security and doing government projects. Uh, I actually got to work on Honeypots with Marty Rush, the author of Snort, uh, which, was, which was pretty good. And I went to a company called US Internetworking, which is a cloud company. And all of that set me up to do two companies. I did an intrusion detection product called Dragon, which was called Network Security Wizards. Sold that. And then we said, look, we really want to do a company focused on sustainability of cybersecurity. So tenable means obtainable and defendable. So who wouldn't want obtainable and defendable network security? And I did that for about 14 years. Had a bunch of great, great co-founders, great company. Just recently brought in a Meet Your Ann, former CEO of RSA, to take over. And now I'm doing um, investing in cybersecurity companies. And um, talk just a little bit about how the market has changed in that time that you went from starting Tenable to to now, I mean, we're, there's just a, it's a, it's a huge space, there's a tremendous amount of activity, investment and otherwise, but kind of what was it like back in the day um, trying to sell a, you know, information security tool, basically? Mm -hmm. So when we started Tenable, it was 2002, we had um, a couple interesting dynamics. You mentioned Nessus. Nessus was open source when we, when we started out, so we had a huge base of of users who weren't really, you know, customers, but they were they were users, and that's a very interesting sort of model. And when you look at today's services like 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 Uber and Spotify and all these kind of different things, Google, you know, where you can use freemium services, it feels very similar. But it, back in two thousand two, all the talk was how do you convert users and 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 things like that. The other thing that happened in two thousand two was just after the internet bubble, uh, we had a big bubble. And this concept of a bubble where, and, and what a bubble means for a lot of different people is when you have a dramatic drop in valuations, right? Company might be doing hundred million dollars in revenue and they can't, their stock just goes, goes, goes down or similar companies are trying to raise capital, um, can't raise at a valuation that, that, that makes sense. Um, so now what's real different is everything is up, 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 up. You get occasional blips in the market, like, you know, FireEye missing their numbers or, we had Rapid7 make their numbers, you know, just a couple days ago. Those things are up and down, but the market is generally up, which means everybody's up. Everybody wants to start companies. They want to raise capital. They want to get acquired. They want to go public. It's a very positive time for cybersecurity companies. Yeah, I mean, you you bring up a good point, which is when you, you, you know, um, Tenable was really one of the first companies to um, try and negotiate this um free or free, I guess we call it freemium now, but, you know, take a tool that was basically available, widely used and available for free, had a huge user base, but, but no paying customers really, um, and turning it into a viable commercial product. Um, 
was there much resistance when you started <laughs> shopping that idea around to people? Well, it, it's it's interesting. When we went out and tried to raise money in the early 2002, and we said, look, look at all these users we have, you know, with Nest, look how great, you know, we are. Most of the venture capital folks we talked to said, well, hey, that's that's awesome. You know, how do you make money, right? Why is somebody going to want to do that? And we really understood pretty quickly that, you know, it was a community of users and not necessarily a community of contributors or a community where, you know, it wasn't, there was a lot more balance, right? We weren't even collecting any data, uh, you know, from the, we were very, we try to keep privacy very, very uh, up there. Whereas if you look at a startup today, I don't want to pick up on anybody and said, oh, we've got, you know, 8,000 users or 100,000 users, chances are all that data is stored in the cloud and they're doing something with that, like producing threat intelligence or things. We never did anything, anything like that. Um, and that's another example of how the times have changed. I think people regularly give up information like that to get uh, interesting intelligence these days. So you've gone um, to, uh, as you mentioned, you, you've kind of moved on from Tenable and started your, gone out and started this new venture, um, which is Gula uh, Technology Adventures, which is a name I totally love, um, putting the adventure back into venture capitalism, I guess, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We can also put points to Tampa. Yeah. So talk about, uh, so what's, what's your investment strategy? So are you just doing security companies or are you, um, what, what, how do you go about doing this and who are you deciding, you know, what's your investment vision, I guess, is a way to. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's interesting, right? So we've worked with a lot of great venture capital folks in the entry, awesome companies, Excel, Insight. And, and we said, well, what can we add to the, to, to the market? And, you know, when you think about markets, you got Silicon Valley, you're in Boston, I'm down in, in down by Washington. What we have around here is a sort of a culture, if you will, that's dominated by service providers, right? Companies that are doing great work for the nation, uh, but, you know, they're helping the NSA, the CIA, the DOD, and most of the tech kind of gets sucked up into those things. There isn't this huge amount of, of incubators or, or CEOs such as myself who are helping new companies, you know, start out. So what we said is that, um, you know, I'd love to personally see 10 tenables in this region. And, and what does that mean? It means, you know, companies who are product first, technology first, I'm not saying services is bad. I'm saying it's a different type of culture, different types of offering. And we looked at a lot of different things, just being a silent angel, just uh, perhaps doing an incubator. And uh, we really, you know, set on this, uh, the, the idea of a professional fund that is a lot more than a typical angel but not exactly a full-fledged, you know, venture capital type of uh, type of organization. Now, I believe that every company that I have invested in is going to turn into the next Uber, and uh, we will create a big fund out of that. But that maybe you can interview me a couple of years down the road and see how well we did there. <laughs> Live from your hundred-foot yacht, yes. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> as far as the the investment thesis, uh, it's really two different things. I mean, I've been doing this for about twenty years. I can typically look at a PowerPoint or have a conversation with an individual and know probably about 5, 10, 15 minutes if this is a good investment or they got the right outlook or if it's something that's good for the industry. And then after that, it's just a matter of maybe we can help them out with, uh, with a little bit of capital. Maybe we can help them raise capital. Maybe we help them with their roadmap. Uh, I just, I've had two calls this morning with companies we've invested in. They're preparing for RSA. They're preparing for follow-on raises. They're reacting to things like Invincia you know, being acquired by Sophos. And uh, that's, I'm enjoying doing that. I have a lot to offer. And I, I actually still find myself being very um, learning from a lot of people. Right? You can't do everything. So I, I love sort of having my fingers involved with, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, technologies, especially stuff outside of Tenable's purview. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about security in my experience is, you know, there's there's constant innovation really on both sides, right? So the bat, I mean, the security industry continues to stay fresh and vibrant because criminals uh, and bad guys continue to innovate at a very rapid pace. They're, they're actually tremendous innovators. Um, and, and the security market often has to respond to that in various ways, right? Um, but the problem with that is, is there can be a lot of um, kind of me tooism, you know? So, so something becomes sort of hot or timely, and 
and everybody tries to tack or pivot over to whatever that problem is, regardless of where they started. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, what do you do? You advise your customers, uh, your your funded companies, you know, against that kind of short term thinking, you know, trying to be relevant and topical, no matter what the conversation is. So it's it's uh, it's an interesting problem. I I'm uh, one of the things I like about uh, doing. Uh, the type of cyber investing we're doing is that we're not looking a hundred percent for the next the next uber in other words i'm willing to work with somebody maybe invest a little bit of money in their company and help them get acquired for you know maybe not the headlines that uh you know invincia might have gotten with uh, with, with, with sophos um but it's still a feature that we know vendors are going to want it's good for the economy around here it's good for the ecosystem it's also a good a good investment um, but having said that, you know, we tend to look at things as investing in detecting the bad guys, as investing in detecting compliance and risk frameworks and things like that, and also investing in resilient type of, of uh, technologies and infrastructures. Because you can have the best intrusion detection, you can have the best framework. There's no guarantee that you're not going to be attacked tomorrow, though. So new technologies like containers and maybe designing websites on top of um, you know, sustainable design patterns, things like that. There's, those things are future, future things. And we've actually done a bunch of investments in all three of those areas. Okay, so this is sort of the segment of Security Ledger Live where we're going to talk just a little bit about like the security news of the week, right? Where it's Friday, we're getting ready for the weekend. <laughs> um, we're getting ready for the RSA conference. We'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, later in the show. Um, but let's let's talk about some of, some of what went down um, this week. So the first one I'm going to go to is you mentioned it a couple times already, which is a big acquisition in the security market, which uh, uh, Invincia, a kind of next generation endpoint security company, got acquired by Sophos, mm -hmm. a UK based antivirus software maker. Sophos been around for uh, I don't know probably close to 30 years. Um, and uh, they made a $100 million acquisition of Invincia with some, I guess, some earnouts built into the deal as well. Uh, and I think Invincia had around $44, $45 million in funding going in. So your thoughts on that, both as a security guy and as a VC guy? So a couple, couple things. I mean, if you're looking back and saying, wow, why is Sophos doing an acquisition you know, like this? They've actually done a lot of acquisitions. They they got some. Uh, they got a firewall called the Starro, which was which was really good, really popular. Uh, now they got this this, this Invincia. And you might say, well, why would somebody with all those resources do an acquisition? And the problem is, is that when you're a big company like Sophos, you most of your resources go into supporting your existing customers and your existing product lines. I'm not saying it's hard to innovate. It's believe it or not, you have a resource problem. So even though you're that big it becomes very, very difficult to say, well, let's work on this. Let's look at this problem completely different and um, try to bring it to our customers. So doing an acquisition, uh, you know, people like Cisco are great at this. It's easier to acquire than it is to build your own R&D. And there's a lot of ex-Cisco people out there who've given talks on, on they can actually prove it from an economic point of view. Yeah. Uh, this particular acquisition I'm very happy for because it is kind of around the beltway. It's a Virginia, D.C. kind of thing. It also came from, uh, from DARPA. Uh, technology to some extent and you know that's some of the sort of the natural advantages the Maryland DC kind of ecosystem has you've got the NSA the CIA you've got DARPA DOD Hopkins you got all these different things here and I like seeing technologies like this show up into broader platforms right. uh, stuff designed for the government tends to be over designed a, a little bit but frankly people need that uh, a lot of the problems with it i think the security marketplace today is you can buy a product that just does one thing really well when you really need it to do 20 things really well so you raise a couple points i mean one is the sort of and and we had this conversation offline as well which is why I, i'm always amazed that companies with the resources of a sophos or symantec or mcafee intel um aren't able to see the writing on the wall and and develop internally the new features technologies they need to keep their product relevant and this is a great example of that people have been saying for years that the 
any virus software such as it is, you know, signature-based detection, which means, you know, you're looking at, you know, a, a particular profile of a specific piece of malicious software and then trying to flag that when you see it, uh, isn't working, isn't scaling, doesn't, doesn't stop new threats, and, and new threats are pretty much all the threats these days. Um, and yet, and, and, and they get that as well, and yet it falls to a, a startup basically to invent the solution to that or come up with the solution to that, which in Invincia's case, and there are a bunch of companies that do this, is this kind of um, machine learning based um, uh, advanced threat protection um, that's looking at a whole bunch of different variables um, in terms of how malicious actors and malicious software behaves uh, to, to make determinations that something mm -hmm. is amiss. Um, I'm always just astounded that that given the resources and the money these companies have, that they can't do that internally. But but you say uh, no, it's it's uh, it's harder than it sounds. It, it's absolutely harder than it sounds. There's really two sort of macro effects going on. So this one is if you have to stop what you're doing and get the company to repivot, that takes a tremendous amount of resource. And I'll just talk about this from a Tenable point of view. Tenable is releasing something called Tenable IO at RSA this year. It's all cloud. 100% cloud, uh, yep. SaaS-based, back-end design. But for years, we've been selling this on-prem uh, solution called Security Center, which is designed to not work with the cloud. The amount of, of conversations we had to have, and Tenable's approaching 1,000 people, is just tremendous. And, and when you're talking somebody the size of Sophos, somebody the size of a checkpoint, somebody where you have many, many, many different uh, other groups that you have to coordinate, it's very difficult to get people to turn on a dime like that. Now, the second thing is credit. Within the company, you're saying that different, yeah. different groups or interest groups or product groups within, a, within an organization. Let's say Sophos was able to come out with a, a, a Skunkworks project for patch management. And, and they ship this, right? And everybody's using it. The market still might not give any credit for that. If you look at the biggest companies out there, CyberArk, you know, Qualys, you know, these big public companies, Palo Alto. If they try to offer something outside of their wheelhouse, so to speak, the market doesn't necessarily reward that. As much as people say that they want to reduce vendors and have right. featured products, they actually want their antivirus vendors to do antivirus. They don't want them to do patch management, these other things. And the exception is when you do an acquisition. If you do an acquisition, people give you a pass on that, and they say, well, let me look at that new thing and stuff like that. So a couple macro effects going on there. Um, I think it's a good move for Sophos. It's it's uh, it's a good move for Invincia, obviously, and uh, hopefully it's a good move for the market to move away from, you know, signature-based detection towards a bit more preventative stuff. That's really fascinating. So it's it's almost like the the it, the acquisition is less about the ability to develop the technology than the kind of narrative that you're creating for the broader investment community and it's easier to sort of present that narrative as a, oh well we bought this new capability and now it's part of our suite than to say well we added that in version you know 6.8 and but it's the same product and the market's going to say well you know that's we expect you to keep innovating that mm -hmm. way and yeah that's really interesting um you mentioned the beltway um yeah I, it, it it is interesting i mean the beltway in my um, thinking is, is this a huge uh, area of innovation and investment around cybersecurity for obvious reasons? The government's a huge consumer of this stuff. Um, and yet we've seen fewer, um, you know, your company is the exception and Invincia as well, but it seems like there has been less M&A around this, um, but maybe that's starting to change now. As, as some of these uh, security startups of the last 10 years uh, re reach maturity and either IPO uh, level or uh, acquisition level. Yeah, I still think we're in early days when it comes to cyber. And although there's less companies sort of in this region, if, I think if we added up my region and, and your region and, and even Austin and Atlanta, you still don't come up to the numbers that are in Silicon Valley. I think the difference is, is that companies on the East Coast tend to be more uh, on substance and less on positioning. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons you'll see more acquisitions like Invincia. Um, you know, in the next couple of years. The uh, other, um, on, the, on the sort of threats and malware piece, the other big news we saw came out of uh, Kaspersky Lab. There's uh, some new fileless malware that's circulating. This seems to be the new thing where basically um, attackers are using administrative tools that are either built into Windows or they're just commonly used in network environments to do, to move laterally to uh, within a network to, um, 
uh, you know, infect and gain a foothold on a network. And that seems to be the case here. We've got a, a malware that's running within memory, so there's no file to detect, really. There's nothing on disk. Um, and then heavy use of PowerShell and these other administrative tools to do reconnaissance and um, move laterally within the network. That sounds like it's a really hairy problem to solve. Yeah, it's interesting. And there's actually a name for it. So if you think of software, malware, adware, this stuff's called nowhere. And, and uh, it's just to, you know, to signify the fact that there isn't evil.exe, a malicious file. There's not even a hash that you can kind of go and look for. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, th these kind of attacks have been around for a while. Uh, if you think about memory attacks, you know, maybe I can hit you when you come to a malicious website and you click on a link. And now I've injected something into your, your, uh, your, your, your memory and it's, it's running on your computer, but there's no evil.exe that you can find. Of course, that's everybody's nightmare. And there aren't that many tools on the market that can look in memory. Uh, you know, so there's some really good stuff from uh, uh, Velexity. They have the open source volatility framework. They got some great commercial products as well. And, uh, but acquiring, you know, memory only uh, images is very difficult. Uh, this also gives sort of a shot in the arm to all the network analysis folks, because if you're, you know, if you're an agent and you're on the system and you can't even look at memory or, you know, do that kind of analysis, at least if you're in memory, you've got to have some sort of communication, some SSL traffic. Maybe you're going to going to uh, tunnel out over somebody else's protocol. So this is sort of giving a shot in the arm to all the new network forensics, network telemetry, network metadata type uh, type people that are are, are out there. Of course, a great way to combat this stuff is with cyber hygiene, right? The more you lock things down internally, the more you know attack surface you reduce, the easier it is for you to detect when something like this indeed is happening. So you think uh, more emphasis on network forensics in in this age in which um, you know the tools that are being used again aren't aren't distinct um, malicious programs, rats or what have you, but are the you know tools that your own employees are using to manage um, uh, your own network. Uh, and I, I talk in terms of like walking around the floor at RSA. You're actually going to see a class of companies that says we we don't care what your security investment is. We we assume it's going to fail. And when you see, you know, Ron Gula logging onto the database server, the source code server, Ron never does that. So, so by definition, let's go investigate those things. And there's a whole variety of companies that can do this at the switch layer, the forensics layer, the log layer, and um, you know, it, it, it helps solve that problem. Okay, the other big news this week, uh, Security Ledger wrote about it, was a case uh, that the company Vizio. Uh, smart television set maker settled with the FTC. This goes back to a 2014 um, case, I think, um, if, I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, it was ProPublica that first kind of uh, exposed this, that these Vizio smart TVs were harvesting a whole bunch of information on viewers really without their uh, say-so. There was no um, disclosure to viewers that their viewing behavior was going to be collected and analyzed by Vizio. Uh, FTC filed suit, and uh, you know, two years later, more or less, we got a settlement from Vizio around two point two million dollars. Um, this is just the latest FTC case, seemingly related to Internet of Things type uh, devices. We had a D-Link, um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Net, net, uh, net no, Gear, yeah, um, Netgear, yep. Um, uh, no, there was a D-Link uh, mm -hmm. case that the FTC filed. Thoughts on this? Um, you know, new administration in, so who knows what's coming out of the FTC, but uh, is this good news for consumers, good news for the industry? So I think I think the FTC is doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, however, I think in practice, I think everybody just assumes that they're being monitored, whether it's their phone, the phone carrier, you know, the app that, the, that they put on. You know, Uber just recently changed how often they're going to track you, you know, once you leave. You know when they drop you off. So I think everybody's assumed that they are under surveillance, no matter what device that they're that they're doing. Um, <laughs> so I think FTC is doing the right thing, saying, "Hey, look, you're collecting data. You didn't tell people that you're collecting data, and that's and that's fine." But I think most of the content people watch on their TV these days comes from Netflix, FiOS, Comcast, where they're already being monitored and and, and whatnot. But there's one other kind of subtle point here that I like to talk about. So there, here you have a device on the network that's going to send back some sort of telemetry. And yet you have a whole industry of anomaly detecting 
network intrusion detection systems and data leakage systems and 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 and, th and things like that. Nobody had one of these Vizio TVs at the office and noticed that it was going out. Now maybe these things just fell silent and you know you don't if they can't get out you don't talk. But I'm always amazed when I see a story like this. How come we didn't see, you know, a company like a Sourcefire Cisco or you know e even a um, you know, like a checkpoint, say, hey, wait a second, you know, all of our customers are seeing, or Palo Alto, right? All of our customers are having TVs exfiltrate. I mean, it looks just like a botnet at that point. Yes. And, um, you know, we don't see those things like that. It is interesting, you know, that, that they generally are not the source of these types of revelations. It's either, um, you know, a, a, a sort of security minded consumer who bought it and just um, did the analysis in their own home network. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't remember how ProPublica got, got wind of, that this was going on as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, these smart TVs, we think we talk about them like they're consumer devices, and basically they are. But man, they're also running in, in office environments. They're running for sure. embedded, right. embedded Linux in the office. And yep. as much as everybody talks about IoT, I, so some of the pitches I've been getting are basically companies who want to whitelist internet connections uh, outbound and basically encapsulate all of those IoT traffic and, and uh, whether it's a TV or a, a SCADA device or things like that. It's, it's an interesting problem. Okay, um, uh, final topic of conversation, uh, Ron Gula of Tenable, uh, formerly of Tenable, now Gula <laughs> <laughs> Technology. I get a dollar uh, every time somebody says that, right? <laughs> you can't disown it. Um, uh, RSA conference is next week in San Francisco. First of all, are you going to be there? I will be there. I'll be right. supporting a lot of the companies that we're working with and trying to learn as much as I can. And uh, pretty much I'm showing up and staying awake for like, like 48 hours straight. So the, <laughs> yeah. the parties go late and the breakfast start early, right? <laughs> yeah, that is basically the way, uh, that's basically the way it goes. So, so talk a little bit about what you're going to be looking for and what you think the sort of the, the meta trends are at RSA this year. Um, you know, what's, as a venture capitalist now, kind of walking the floor, what are you going to be looking for? And just what's your sense talking to some companies who are going there and just being plugged into the industry of what the um, big topics of conversation are going to be? So I, I think I think the big topics this year are still going to be uh, a lot like last year, although there'll be a bigger uh, uh, um, uh, percentage of people talking about machine learning. And, uh, you know, machine learning comes in two, two flavors. I call it the strong machine learning and the weak machine, machine learning. But the strong one is where you do real data science. You have lots of data. You don't know what your algorithms or signatures are going to be until you do the data science. And then you ship, you know, uh, rules to go find whatever type of badness it is, whether it's in an executable or network traffic. To, companies like Silence are, are, are doing that. The other type of machine learning is the weak one where you are auditing what's on your network and then looking for anomalies after that. Both of these are really, really sim are, are, are useful, but they're completely different. So I'm curious to see who's applying it and what they're applying it to, and obviously what marketing claims are are going to be going beyond. Um, you know, as as a potential investor, I'm always looking for unique technology. Uh, I'm actually going to be doing two deals right now. One of them is a stealth company, and uh, another one will be announcing after RSA. and And I don't believe that anybody has seen technology like this to date. Because the vast majority of companies are doing some sort of word sensing, where you mix some threat and reporting and analytics with that, maybe some machine learning, and and then you and then you try to clone, own whatever you're owning, Amazon, Netflow, you know, logs, you know, what, whatever your domain is. I think there's a lot of opportunity for disruption with completely different ways to look at these problems. That's one of the things I like about being a uh, you know potential investor to these companies. So the 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 buzz around machine learning and artificial intelligence these days um, help us understand that is in in this security context is is this being driven would you say by just the difficulty companies have finding talent and so we're we're looking to use machine learning and computers to to um, reduce our reliance on humans. Um, or is the idea maybe that computers could do this better than humans? That the that the end goal here is full automation of some of these functions that we now rely on people to do. Yeah. So clearly, you need a lot of automation, just given the scale and speed of, of how big internets have become. Whether it's a, a cloud network, an on-prem network, or just you know a hundred thousand people logging on to your your Google instance of of, of Gmail. So. 
machine learning, artificial intelligence, anomaly detection, people tend to throw those things around. What I said before about like the strong machine learning is, is, is real data science where you don't know the answers and you literally let the data, you know, and these algorithms um, come up with new algorithms and signatures to look for things you don't even know about. And people mm -hmm. do this in cancer research. They do this in predicting the weather. They do this in many, many, many different things. But true data science, you throw a lot of data at these things and you don't know which column of data is going to be the thing that's the, your, your key identifier. Problems are trying to solve. Is this malware malicious, right? Is this network traffic malicious, right? Is this set of behaviors, you know, malicious? Is this insider uh, a threat to my company? Um, that's those are tough problems, and uh, I think machine learning can help with that. Uh, final question. It strikes me, and this is sort of, sort of final comment because we need to wrap it up. Um, you know, RSA conference started as a gathering of uh, encryption experts, cryptography experts. Um, it's named after you know the uh, RSA uh, algorithm and the and the gentleman who invented that. Um, it strikes me that these days um, encryption is is a sexy topic, um, <laughs> uh, and and applications that are protecting your communications and so on. OPSEC, kind of generally broadly written, is a very topical thing. So um, uh, your your thoughts on that? It strikes me that. Uh, Everybody is talking these days about encryption and, and using encryption to protect your communications, protect your identity online. This seems like it's a, it's a real topic of our time. It's interesting. So I was at the NSA in the mid-90s when we had the Clipper chip uh, come out. And for those who don't remember that, the Clipper right. chip was basically a, a, a set of algorithms and, and chips where you and I could have a secure conversation on the phone and only the government could could have the keys to that under a court order and 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 boy america did not like that i think if we had that debate again today i think we would have a completely um different outcome but it's interesting to say there was a lot of protests about uh, not i wouldn't say protests but there was a lot of discussion about should the government be able to get into the san bernardino terrorists you know phones and you know let alone the phone calls that they may have made you know from that uh, from that device so there's a lot of opportunity for that i am looking at a lot of companies that do encryption uh people are using you know blockchain encryption that's i, I see probably see one presentation a week where people are applying blockchain blah 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 to group chat you know voice to to to, to working together to encrypting data there's also people who are doing a lot of things with the cloud the cloud has got amazing flexibility to let your devices you know, connect to it. But a lot of times, if you're using Dropbox or Box, those files are out there um, on your computer unencrypted. So if you get popped at the endpoint, you have no protection over that. Even though your disk is um, uh, encrypted, the malware is operating at a higher layer. Um, and then finally, there's people who are trying to take encryption to a whole new level and just encrypt everything they do, uh, whether it's the, the, the VPN going back home, their, their uh, traffic to Google, uh, you know, when you when you think about all the different types of encryption you have, why is it not unified under one policy? Right. It gets really, really. Dip. So there's a lot of opportunity for improvement there. There absolutely is. Is it um, kind of foolhardy or naive for people to think, oh, well, if I just switch to using an app like um, Signal or Wire um, from using, you know, uh, just the uh, iPhone chat app or something like that, that I'm, I'm crossing my T's and dotting my I's when it comes to uh, government surveillance or, or um, you know, even cyber criminal surveillance. Of, I, I, I think it's opinion. interesting. I think for for voice, I think people are they're not aware how many unique and untrusted infrastructures your phone call goes across. Whereas we're doing this conversation over Google uh, Google Hangouts, it's well documented how much security is between you and me right now. But if we're done with this and, and we have a call to, to, to wrap this up, that call's unencrypted. It's going over multiple lines. People don't really understand that. Um, same thing, if you're going to chat, I think the vast majority of, of, of texting and chat applications are very secure. Apple's done a good job. Facebook's done a good job. They've all locked those things down. So when you have the ability to control, who, maybe you're a Wicker user or, or, or something like that, you're, you're just choosing your religion at that point. You're trying to practice you know, good good. High. But if somebody has control of your endpoint, those attacks are are not there. And if you have a big enough circle of friends and want to take your 
trusted chat message and send it to the New York Times, um, you know, then then that's the risk you're kind of you're kind of running. Um, so if I use Wicker as my religion, am I then a Wiccan? There you go. Yes, absolutely. All security is a form of religion, and we can do that. Talk about that next time. <laughs> right. okay. uh, Rangula um, of Gula Technology Adventures. Yeah, Gula Tech Adventures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on Security Ledger Live. It was a great conversation. No surprise. Um, it's always a great conversation talking to you. And um, I will see you out in San Francisco. And we're going to have to come back and do this again. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Congratulations on your second your second show. Second. Number Good two. Job. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Rod.